the purpose that I have you going to 1 John is purely personal. Uh, this week, probably uh, sometime Thursday morning, I've found myself doing this not on any kind of a, of a uh, necessary schedule, but I have in my office a plastic tote. It's about a little bit bigger than the size of this pulpit, and it's about this deep, and it is from top to bottom, from left to right, from front to back, packed full of handwritten notes by who I affectionately refer to as the circuit writer. Um, so I just pulled out a handful of these, and there my dad wrote sermons on maybe just about any kind of piece of paper he could find. They, they weren't uniform. They weren't from the same notebook. They were, some of them were three by five cards. Some were five by six cards. Some were yellow legal pages. Some were uh, spiral notebook pages. Some, I haven't been through all of them. I'm, I anticipate, uh, because I've written several sermons on the back of receipts that I've never turned into Renee, that um, maybe someday I'll find some of those receipts you need to turn into the IRS. But... There, there are handwritten sermon notes. And the way my dad wrote sermons were not transcript sermons. They were uh, outlined sermons. And so to look at them, you don't get the full breadth of the sermon. You just get the bullet points. You don't get the personality. You don't get the, the delivery. You just get here's, here's where he started and here's, where he, here's how he went and how, here's how he got to the conclusion. You don't have any, he, he rarely wrote out illustrations that he would include in the sermons, but he certainly took advantage of illustrations. Um, but I just thought tonight I might, uh, and maybe I've done this two or three times with you, I thought I'd just bring, bring a piece of paper out of the treasure box and preach it. Um, these won't be all of his words. The outline is his, and, uh, and I thought, you know what, Dad? I I think I think I would I'd love to hear you preach that again. It was August the 30th when he preached this, 1981. I was still at home. I was 15 years old. Uh, 15 years old in Rifle, Colorado. Have you ever been on Interstate 70 on the western part of Colorado? It's just between the blessed glory of the Rocky Mountains and the desert of uh, western Colorado and Utah. Uh, which So August 30th probably meant it was a hot afternoon, a hot day. Temperatures in western Colorado and that stretch can be, be much like they are here in Twin Falls in that time of the year. But it was the height of the oil shell boom. You remember 19... Remember the, 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 the fuel crisis we were in as a nation in the 1970s? Well, we discovered oil in the mountains of western Colorado, and they're told, we're told even today, we have more oil in the shale rock of Colorado, the western slope of Colorado, than there is in most all of the Middle East, Russia, Iran combined. The problem is, it's in rock. <laughs> You can, you can, it's the strangest thing. You can take some of this oil shell and strike a match on it, and that rock will eventually take a flame. Uh, you can't run your vehicle on it, but it's an amazing thing. We heard stories of, it's a beautiful piece of rock too, this oil shell. If you know what shell is, it's a, it's a fragmented rock that breaks easily. The oil shell is a beautiful rock. It's got lots of color in it. And it would, it would make a beautiful fireplace. You rock and stone around your fireplace. The problem is it would burn your house down. And uh, that may have been how they discovered oil shell. <laughs> Some poor guy thought, man, I'm going to make the most beautiful fireplace in all of western Colorado. And his house burns down. Can't show it to anybody. Well, it was the height of the oil shell boom. That meant for a little town of Rifle, Colorado, Sleeper Town, it boomed. It, it became the focal point of all of the oil economy of the United States. So it was, it was, this, it was in the height of this that I, 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 I'll, I'll never forget those days. This, um, 
what would perhaps be otherwise a, a, a rather uh, unsupposing uh, individual who was not ashamed to preach with a homemade suit jacket. Uh, and he, was, he looked good in them too. You know, the 70s. Everybody made their own suit jackets. Not everybody looked good in them. <laughs> but Clyde Thompson could sport a homemade suit coat. You did a good job, Mom. <laughs> the height of the oil shell boom, August 30th, 1981. I, I would imagine at this time that that little chapel, Rifle Southern Baptist Chapel, was packed full. People from the south flooded the western slopes of Colorado in search of Baptist church to make themselves a part of. That little rifle, Southern Baptist Chapel, August the 30th of 1981, the circuit rider uh, with, with in this, these particular notes, I should have brought them over here to show you, written on about six yellow pieces of small notebook paper, one-sided. Took to the pulpit, and the title of this sermon was in, in, entitled, The Three temptations of the church. So Christ, he, he, and he took our attention to 1 John chapter 2, so that's where I would invite you to join me. We won't be here long. It doesn't appear that the circuit rider spent much time at all in 1 John, but this was the starting point. This was the basis of the message. 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17. The Word of God states it like this, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world, or anything, or if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Now I think it's just, it's not important to the preaching text, and it's not important to the sermon, but perhaps it's important just in church history uh, from this vantage point of a otherwise small, out-of-the-way little chapel in Rifle, Colorado, that at the height of the oil shell boom, which means at this point in 1981, we're probably less than a year away from the bust when everybody pulled out. Every, jobs were lost, people were des desolate, the economy tanked. Even though in the 1980s, it appeared as though the economy of the United States seemed to be increasing, but that little mountain community of Rifle, Colorado that went from boom to bust within a very small amount of time, it would seem from this vantage point today quite prophetic that the circuit rider would preach this message at the height of the boom. Listen, listen to the outline of the text, and, and I believe it'll be a blessing to you. It, it certainly has been to me. It's been, it's been a, a fresh moment to have, have been taught yet again. I wish I'd have paid attention in 1981 <laughs> at, at his 15 year old uh, teenage boy. This has been good. From this, we can learn a couple of starter things that there is a lust of the flesh, there is a pride of this life, there is a lust of the eyes. And, and the church must do everything that she can to guard herself from succumbing to the temptations of Satan. You know, how often do you hear the preacher talk about the temptations on our souls, upon our individual lives? But when, does the, when, when do you hear a preacher preach about the cautions of the temptations upon the church, the body itself, the, the congregation? Christ, Christ was tempted in all parts as we are. And we are tempted as he was. And I think that's an important thing to see that's in both ways for us to see. Christ was tempted like we were. 
But it'll also be important that we see that the way Christ was tempted are in ways in which we would be tempted as well. And specifically here in this context and from this vantage point of that rifle Southern Baptist Chapel, a caution and a consideration that we would, we would look at this as a corporate body as well as an individual message to us as well. So we... He moved, he didn't, it, 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 there's nothing in his notes that he gives anything more of this. The title and the sermon text are right here. And then, I'm sure there was a lot of other important things that he said, but he didn't write them down. So I'm not going to assume what he had to say and pretend that I recalled everything that he had to say at that moment. But it's fitting, the next thing he does is he takes us to the Gospel of Matthew. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4. And let's listen, pay attention, and learn from the temptations of Christ. And let's make the application of these, certainly let's make them personal. But let's consider them from the vantage point of the corporate body, of the church. So as Christ was tempted in all points, as the church is, so the church can look at Christ and see the way Satan tempted Christ, so Satan may tempt the church. Look at the text in Matthew chapter 4. I'll begin reading in verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. This is immediately following his baptism. He was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I would. This is not in the sermon notes here, but I would stop and say that's quite important to note. Christ was led to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I think it would be important to know this church that it's not beyond us that we would be tempted by the devil. Well, anyway, he says after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. One of the larger understatements of the Bible perhaps. <laughs> and the tempter came and he said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but, by every, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Well, then the devil took him to a holy, to the holy, into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, then throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory, their glory. And he said... To him, Satan said to Jesus, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Now we'll break that down into three major areas. There's really nothing... All that surprising when you're going to have a message that's going to cover verses 1 through 11 of Matthew chapter 4 that is going to be three major headings. And so they're broken down like this. The first one is titled the bread business. So Jesus, the first temptation of Jesus was to turn these stones into bread. Satan wanted Jesus apparently some kind or some, some fashion to go into the bread business, the circuit rider is how the circuit rider put it. He, he, he says there, there is, a, there is a, a bread business that he wants to distract the church with. A, a, a church tempted to go into hunger programs and poverty projects may become very occupied and forget that man shall not live by bread alone. 
In other words, a church can become so engaged in feeding the hungry that she forget to deliver the message that man does not live by food alone. And certainly this could be a temptation. Can you not see the, the potential temptation that this would exist for Jesus, that if he were to divert his attention away from the proclamation of his father's business and the doing of his father's business and just simply be about that of feeding the hungry, then it would be a, a, a misdirected ministry. Further, the message went on and said, hunger is a matter for the church to concern her with, herself with for sure. You, could, you should consider Acts chapter 4, uh, or excuse me, Acts chapter well, I didn't write down what chapter it is. Uh, it's in that, that portion of Acts where the apostles, the, 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 who have devoted themselves to the proclaiming of the word and have devoted themselves to the work, the ministry of prayer, are so overcome by, by social needs of the hunger of the widows predominantly. That, so Acts chapter 6, that there's seven, that the church actually appoints seven men to tend to the needs of the hunger and the poor. And so it's not that it's not a right place for the church to invest ministry in, but if the church makes it a priority of the work, then it will be a misdirecting work. So again, would it not be an appropriate word for a church that is living in her heyday in 1981 to be hearing from the preacher not knowing that, it, that just within a few short months, a bust would come and major economic problems would begin to cripple people's lives. To caution the church, your, church, your duty is not primarily to the, to the work of feeding the, hunger, the hungry. Uh, the attention here is that man does not live by bread alone. In our work, we must be certain about it from the beginning. We must be aware of it, that our work includes that, but it, uh, it is not primarily that. He further said that there is a distracting possibility where, where we become more concerned with the feeding of bodies than we are with the feeding of souls. Indeed, a grave danger would exist when our, when our priority is that of the social work or a humanitarian work, where indeed it is part of our duty. But if doing so at the expense of our primary work, the primary work always suffers. Some, are, some, he further stated, have gathered institutional church members. They've made institutional members of them trying to take care of food and entertainment and social and sporting events. Uh, attention to this tempts the church to give herself to social ministry rather than producing Christians that live by biblical principles. If the Christian who's devoting himself and working in the social care of, of the society is not being at the same time instructed in how to live godly biblical lives, it will be that that will not be displayed or passed on. It will be really just simple humanitarian care that gets passed on. And we've known this We've known this for decades. We've known this from all of the church's existence. Anybody can feed the poor. And we don't disparage anyone from feeding the poor. And we, we should not shun ourselves or close our eyes from that right work for the church to do. But if that's all we do, then we're no different than just anybody else. In all reality, we've become just another organization. We're no longer the church of the living God. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not an, a, a, an alliterator. Where I, I, I have a thesaurus. I know how to use it. But, and I haven't seen this a lot in my dad's sermons, but uh, it showed up here. He, he, he had four things. It probably just worked well. Soup, soap, socializing, and salvation. Our church's duty is the, is the latter of the list, it should be the first. But tragically, what happens many times is attention to the soup, to the soap, to the socializing. Well, the church is not to this. Beware, he warned the church that September 
morning, 1981, beware lest soup, soap, shows, and socializing take the front stage. Imagine, he says further, if the prodigal son had been given soup and a bed, he would never have returned to his father. Doesn't mean, again, the church should not give attention to these matters, but can you see that if we make that our priority, we may be actually in the, in the work of hindering people from returning to the Father. We must exercise discernment. Our business, the church, is to proclaim the gospel. He put an exclamation point. I don't know many times my dad ever preached with an exclamation point, but it's in his notes. Proclaim the gospel. That's our work. That's our primary work, and so give ourselves to it. So not only is there the bread business of verses 1 through 4, then there's the temptation of the show business. Consider the second temptation from verses 5 through 7. Can you imagine if the town crier announced, Jesus of Nazareth will now leap from the temple at 10 a.m. There might well be a great crowd show up, but be sure of this, there would be few converts. That was an attempt to say, church, don't, don't get carried away with show business. Don't get carried away with glitzy glamour. Don't get carried away with that which you think might attract a crowd. That time when you think you've gathered the largest crowd you've ever had in your church's history, look closely at it. Are there any converts at all? Are there any real converts at all? It says, may that the end, many say that the end justifies the, mean, the means. If this would be, then Satan would have Jesus be in the show business. Keep in mind again, I doubt highly that anyone knew in August of 1981 that that, that sleepy little mountain town of Rifle, Colorado, that was exploding in growth, exponential kind of growth. I mean, there were new towns being plotted out. This is how fast the, ex the explosion of the population was happening. Nobody in their, in, in their thinking would think that a word from the preacher would need to caution the church to be careful about the show business. Because in, in a few short months, people will be loading their U-Hauls and leaving town. What will you gather the crowds for then? careful he heralds to the church be careful that you not give yourself to the show business the church is, is, is to run a lifeboat not a showboat that's all he wrote and how true it is huh the church should not give herself to the work and to the business of entertaining the masses. The gospel is, it, 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 it is not suited for entertainment. The gospel is not a three-ring circus. The devil came suggesting that the angels would join the show. Jesus, jump off from here. The angels will catch you. Satan tempted Jesus Bring the angels along and make them part of the sideshow. Make them part of the entertainment. No, God ordered them differently. And we see that at the very last verse, which we'll, we'll come to again. God sent the angels not to be part of a show. God sent the angels to minister to His Son. Not glamour and glitzy at all, is it? The same is true for us. The angels are not here to help us assist in gathering a crowd. They're here to help us to resist the devil. 
not to help us to obey the devil. Jesus, he walked on water, he fed the multitudes, he raised the dead, he healed the sick. He made blind to see and he made crippled to walk. He cast out demons and he healed the lepers. He turned water into wine, not for show, not because the devil suggested it, but he did so for the glory of the Father, to do the work of the Father. On Pentecost, the, the early church saw thousands of souls converted. He makes note of this. They apparently didn't take advantage of any modern day publicity or entertainment to gather the crowd. They leaned on the power of God. Christ was really quite low-key in his ministry. Satan tempted Jesus to be part of the bread business, the show business, and the final temptation here, he tempted him to be part of the political business. You see that in Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. All the kingdoms of the world... Satan says, it's yours. He poses the question, did Satan have the permission, did he have the authority to give this? Uh, he writes in his notes in a different color of pen, so apparently some thoughts that came later on. He says, temporarily, yes, he had permission, but God always owned all things. Satan had temporal possession. Christianity should get into everything including politics, but politics should never get into the church. The peace that passes all understanding is how the scripture describes it, not the peace that passes legislation. You'd have to know my father to really get the beauty of that kind of a statement. The church does not survive by becoming friendly to politicians by playing power plays with the government. No, the church survives because of the blood of the Lamb. In the early days of the church, the book of Acts, the church, in, in those early days, Christians were constantly in trouble. But because they also knew how to pray, they were unlikely to fall into the temptations of Christ that are listed here. He takes our attention to Psalm chapter 2. So I'd invite you to go there with me as well. This is all he made mention of. He just this was just in parentheses actually along the side margin. So I'm really not even sure if he went there and read or if he just made reference to it, but I went and read it and thought, well, I'm going to read that. He says, why are the nations in an uproar, the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger. And terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son and do not become angry and you perish in the way. For the wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in Him. O church, don't take your refuge in politicians. Find your refuge in Christ. The temptation to the church is to get sideways on this matter and become friendly to the politicians. 
Now, we're not given permission to be unfriendly to the politicians. The caution here is that we not look to the political government to be our refuge. The caution here is to make certain that when you're in the day of trouble, you look to Christ. The early church in Acts chapter 4 are told to conduct their work in boldness. Go and just look and pass through a couple of verses here in Acts chapter 4. The first time, the first verse of, of observation is in verse 13 of Acts chapter 4. The early church needed boldness. Who are we to say today we don't need boldness? We need boldness as the church has ever, if the church has ever needed it, she needs it today. In verse 13, it says this, Now, as they observed the confidence or the boldness, it could be in translated, of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. The boldness of the church needs to be seen again. The boldness of the church in this day was seen by the world. The watching world looked at these men and there was something that was obvious about them that they had been with Jesus. And because they had been with Jesus, they were filled with boldness. Then in verse 29, you see the author records it with this. And now, Lord, take note of their hearts and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. Again, can be translated perhaps even in your translation, as boldness. Boldness was actually sought by the church. The church looked to God to give them boldness. The church didn't look to the government to give her her confidence. The church looked to God. And then finally, you see it in verse 31, that this boldness was supplied by the Holy Spirit. And when they had prayed, note that, maybe even underline that. When they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. You see, this temptation of Satan to distract Jesus, to join him in the political realm, would have been a completely derailing temptation. It would have taken Jesus to a place that he would never have, have made the, the global impact that he ever could have on the hands or on the back of a secular government. No, this is the work for Almighty God. And it's a work that God has given to his church. And so the church should look to God for this boldness. Today, in our day, this was in 1981, the preacher said, few are shaken by what Christians believe. Oh, I, I think that could be heralded from the pulpits of the land still today. Few are shaken by what Christians believe. Now, I think that we could examine that a bit more and say professing Christians who maybe aren't real Christians. They're not shaken by them because their boldness hasn't come from the Holy Spirit. They've put their strength in social ministries. They've put their strength in show business. They've put their strength in the political arena. But to the church, when the church leans upon Christ to be her witness to the ends of the earth, then again we see evidences of it in Acts chapter 4 that the world takes note of it. Oh, for a church today that would be found obedient to God would shake the world. I would plead to God that He would equip us to be that kind of church. The reason that He gives, He poses the statement and then He asks why and then He poses an answer. The statement again is today, few are shaken by what Christians believe. And then He asks the question, why? And he answers it because many churches are on shaky ground. 
As many churches are doing their business, their ministry, by bread business, show business, and political business. Jesus did not change the power structure of his day. Pentecost did not convert the nation. But what did happen was a movement of the Holy Spirit that took the gospel to the nations. The world needs to see what a church is when it is a church. I plead this from God for us, that our community would see us as a church, not just a simple organization that forms herself together with a nonprofit status with the government. Oh, that, that our own community would see what it is when a church is the church. He concludes his message with two straightforward statements. It says, church, meet the, way, meet the devil the way Jesus did. It is written. When the church is tempted, we ought to preach the word. When the church is tempted, we ought to consult the word. When the church is tempted, we must believe the word. And he concluded with, who has become one of my favorite preachers of yesteryear, Vance Havner. And by the way, side note, you, you ought to go, you, you can find sermons by Vance Havner um, in written form and some pretty scratchy audio versions of them. Vance Havner was preaching in the days like, of guys like A.W. Tozer. Um, so 50, 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, Vance Havner preached up until, I believe he was still in his 80s when he was still preaching. But Vance Havner, my dad put a quote from Vance Havner at the conclusion of his message. And he quotes him as this. If Jesus could defeat Satan with three statements, we ought to be able to defeat him with the whole Bible. Church, Let's face the devil the same way Jesus did with the Bible. That's all we got. Let's be pleased that we have it. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless his word. May the Lord bless his church in all generations. You know, messages of, of old are not timely because of the person who preached them. They're timely because they're from an unchangeable God. And his message is true and same for all ages. 1981 might sound to some as an outdated, uh, out of fashion kind of preaching. But it's from the same word that we preach from today. I think this was a good word. To an un unknown little Baptist chapel in Rifle, Colorado, what was just around the corner for them. May it bless his church today. Let me pray for you. Lord, I bless you for today, and I thank you for these timely words. I thank you for the, the kindness of being able from upon occasion, from time to time, to step back and to have the influence of these messages. And Lord, I bless you for them, and I thank you for the influence, not only of the messages and the sermons, but also of the circuit rider himself. Lord, we bless you for your kindness today. And oh, dear God, for our own community, may they find in their midst a church who will be the church. God, bless the city of Twin Falls with a church. Bless the nation, bless the world with a people who will wait for you to give her boldness and then she will be obedient in that boldness. Bless your church with strength to resist the temptations, to become a bread shop, a show business, or a politician. Oh God, give your church resolve to be the church. 
In Jesus' name I pray.